Um, hello, good afternoon, and welcome back from lunch. Uh, we're having now the last session of uh, the event, and uh, we're starting an application session in which we're going to have uh, two talks uh, related to microwave photonics and millimeter wave applications. And uh, finally, we will be closing with some uh, applications for, uh, for Vision. So the first talk uh, today is given by uh, Professor Jose Camani from uh, Photonic Research Lab at uh, this university, and it's titled uh, Integrated Microwave Photonics. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody, good afternoon. Um, okay, as Pascual has said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this uh, subject, which just a few years ago was like a niche, small niche, but nowadays it's starting to grow a little bit bigger and bigger because there are many, many uh, potential applications that will eventually rely on the concepts that um, microwave photonics works with. Um, just to give you a brief outline of my talk, I assume that some of you probably don't have the background of what microwave photonics is, so I think it's in place to have a small introduction to that. And then um, I will try to convince you, uh, hopefully, that we need integration in order uh, to have a microwave photonic systems that can be um, can uh, uh, jump into the commercial arena. And um, in fact, it has been the case that there's some activity uh, uh, during the last five to ten years, which uh, which is growing steadily. And most of this activity has, like in the field of electronics, started with application-specific circuits. But in the same way that it happened with uh, with uh, integrated electronics, nowadays we are trying to probably consider uh, a different uh, focus towards the, the field and trying probably to, uh, to design uh, more general purpose circuits, which hopefully um, I'll be able to, to present in a, in a way of that you can understand. And this is based on a much more uh, general concept, which is programmable multifunctional photonics, which I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce you in this talk as well. And uh, I'm going give, to give you some small varnish of uh, the work that we have been carrying, we have been doing during the last couple of years, or three, um, some examples, and then I will finalize with some concluding remarks. Um, there's, despite that I have ha half an hour, that's not a lot of time to, to give uh, uh, all which I would like to do, uh, to introduce you to all the fields, but, I'm going to try to, to do my best. Right, so microwave photonics is like a, a, a hybrid area of work and brings together the best of the microwave or radio frequency and photonics. And this is because we have a lot of systems where these two worlds have to interact. So it comes, it's only natural to think that we should develop some technology that accommodates both worlds or interfaces them, okay? So, the origin of this area of work was defense, and actually it was in the beginning of the 80s, in the last century, where the main work in microphotonics started, mainly funded by the US Department of Defense. But nowadays there are a lot of civil applications which call for uh, for this technology, and I've just listed a few of them, and I think they are important enough, and they are nowadays are important enough for you to uh, have like a, an idea of, of really what is uh, uh, what are the possibilities of enabling that um, this technology can bring. So first of all, I'm going to try to give you uh, uh, the idea of what is a basic system configuration. Okay, so I'm going to go backwards to a typical radio frequency system, okay? In these systems you have like some source which can be an antenna, an antenna array or even an RF generator uh, that generates some information uh, signal, usually in, in, in terms of side, uh, RF sidebands uh, along the baseband 
And actually what you do is you pass through some system which can be very, very bulky, okay, like uh, um, microwave circuits or transmission lines, etc. And the idea is that this system is going to change or process these sidebands, it's going to process the signal, and then you're going to eventually to either to detect or to radiate the signal. So what microwave photonics does is to substitute this intermediate part that you see here, and it, what we do here is actually we uh, use an auxiliary optical system. We upconvert the signal from the radio frequency band to the optical band by using some technique of external or, or direct modulation of a continuous wave laser. Then we pass this upconverted signal through um, an optical system, an optical core we call it, and this system is going to process the sidebands and now after we have finished with all of that we are going to photo detect the signal to down convert and eventually recover uh, the process radio frequency signal. Why do we need this for? I mean why do we take uh, this uh, apparently simple configuration and complicate it with up converting into the, op into the optical domain? We do this because photonics brings a lot of advantages. Uh, while it is very difficult to reconfigure a microwave uh, filter or microwave system, and you have to do this mechanically, it happens that with uh, simple electronic control signals, you can change uh, the configuration of optical uh, systems, especially if they are integrated. And then, by means of this control signal, you can change or shape your control activity, your signal processing activity, and then actually uh, down convert uh, a new process signal. So optics are, allows for reconfigurability, okay, which traditional radio frequency technologies do not. All right, so this is a main advantage. The other advantage is that optics is low weight, is compact, is broadband, and is also uh, low loss and is electromagnetically immune, which for several applications is a very important feature. Okay, having said that, now, um, why do we care about microwave photonics? Well, we do care because actually, ICT systems are ex expanding in terms of the required capacity in an unconstrained way. You have some, uh, some, short notice uh, here, which give you some of the, of, of, the, of the characteristics of current ICT systems. And I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, specifically to the mobile traffic, okay? And there are some figures there which uh, are not so important. The important fact is that in around 2020, most, more than half of the, all the traffic that is generated per month will in some way or another will have to pass from a fiber segment to a Wi-Fi or a femtocell a 5G or whatever standard is on place at that time. So we need some uh, technology that allows us to do that conversion and that technology is microwave photonics. Okay? We need scalable, flexible, and future-proof solutions because, as I'm going to show now in the next slide, wireless systems are going to um, have this tendency to, to expand in the frequency spectrum. So we need systems that are able to accommodate the current licensed RF bands, but also, as well, they would need to expand to, uh, to cover other areas. And on the other hand, some of these standards are going to require that our, our RF carrier goes up into the spectrum higher. So the uh, cell coverage is going to be much smaller, antennas are going to be, be much smaller, okay? So we need systems that interface fiber and wireless, which are compact. Ideally, if we can put them on a chip, much better, okay? So these are, um, this is like a typical scenario, application scenario, where we have a lot of applications, emerging applications, as we like to say, mobile, 
autonomous driving, even personal uh, wearable devices, whatever. And ideally, we would like to have a base station which has the power to accommodate all this traffic, no matter what, which uh, frequency band are, are each one is using. And for that, uh, as we will see, we will aim to have some kind of integration. Just to fix, give you a, a little bit more of idea of, of, about the bands that are involved, this table gives you more or less a traditional description of the RF spectrum in terms of frequency ranges, band and labeling, etc. What is important about this is that there are very strong emerging applications like 5G and Internet of Things which are going to require or are going to use a lot of different bands, okay, which nowadays are used for other applications. And in some way we would like a device or a system which would be able to accommodate these bands or even have the possibility of reconfiguring. So uh, at a given time, uh, this, uh, the device could select some of these bands or these or, or all of them at the same time. Okay? But the general tendency is to go above in frequency and that is going to require um, a high bandwidth uh, electronics and probably to use photonics as well. So, Microwave photonics, of course, is the best position technology to, to do this, okay? And it has unrivaled unre characteristics because it has to deal with the two worlds, okay? But the main challenge nowadays is to put these systems into a very compact way and a very co compact version because for all of us who have been working for the last 20 or 25 years, we have been assembling big big systems in, in breadboards made of fibers, made of discrete components. So far so good and it's been very good fun, and it's been funny to do science, to do some technology in, in academia, but this is not going to take us much further. I mean, all these systems cannot be used for, um, for commercial applications and for applications which are going to need some interaction with the environment. And of course, uh, they are less than optimized in terms of power consumption, size, weight, etc. So the key issue in microwave photonics is to address what we call SWAP, space, weight and power consumption. This is the this key word in microwave photonics. We have to devise systems which are able to reduce this uh, this um, this figure. And the only way, as in many other technologies, in many other applications, is by integrating. Okay? We have seen that the core of microphotonic system is a photonic, uh, uh, it's a photonic part. So we have to integrate that. We, got, we have to go to integrated photonics. And the fact is that there's, a, there's been a lot of work around this area of integrating microwave photonic circuits for, let's say, six to ten years. And there's a broad list of different subsystems. I'm going to give you just a shot here in this, in this view graph. And by color, by the way, you can see different uh, examples of, of filters, synthesizers, uh, systems to do instantaneous frequency measurements, Hilbert transformers, phase shifters, or whatever, in different technologies. I like to use a different color for each technology, red for indium phosphide, orange for silicon nitride, and, and blue for silicon photonics. So there's a wide range. Uh, there are tens and tens of different application-specific circuits. All these circuits are designed to, to carry out efficiently one single task, okay? So it's, it's, it's okay for many, for many uh, uh, proofs of concept, but uh, they are limited in, 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 in terms of, of, of their functionalities. They are just designed to do well one, only one thing. At the same time, there's been some development of other circuits which were initially thought or designed to perform one, uh, one uh, functionality but which can carry more than one if they are 
slightly modified. Like we have three examples here of, of th three uh, systems which were initially uh, designed for one purpose, but it can be used for, for more than one. So the question arises uh, if um, we should uh, or we could um, uh, try to think about a different scheme which would allow us to have uh, some uh, kind of generic hardware which we could exploit uh, by programming to do different functionalities. The idea is to have only one hardware which you can fabricate and replicate as many times as you can. And this hardware is able to do whatever you want by, uh, by suitable programming. Okay, so that would be the idea. This is the the core concept of what is we call a general multi-purpose multi processor. Again, you see an optical core, which is here. This is the key element, okay? This is the, as you see, there are three different blocks. This is the pure photonics. This is the RF, and this is the control electronics, low, low frequency electronics. And the idea is whether we would be able to design some kind of complex core which would enable us to uh, do these uh, different functionalities without having to specialize the, the internal hardware here. And of course, you have like the typical interface elements of the electronic and electro-optic for modulation of conversion and down conversion. This is like a small replica of the whole macro photonic system that we, uh, we, we have seen. Of course, if we are able to do this, we would also like to provide this system with some optical input, just in case our signal does not come from the, from the chip, but comes from some other place, even from an optical fiber link, and also provide some optical output, just in case we don't want to down convert here, but we want to deliver the signal through an optical fiber link or whatever. And that system would allow you to do different modes of operation as we are going to see now. So, the design of this part is very important, it's key, and belongs to a, a much more general area which is called programmable multifunctional photonics. What is that? It's just an approach, it's a very generic approach because it's something that would lead us to uh, use a common optical hardware to implement a variety of functionalities using that common hardware, but the only thing we have to be able is to program it adequately. So it's a very transversal concept, it's not new. It's been used for many years in other areas of work. And there, here are some examples in electronics, you have FPGAs or, or DSPs instead of application specific circuits. In networks, you have subtly defined networks instead of ad hoc topologies and configurations. In radio, you have several radio receivers. So I guess all these will ring you some internal bell because they are very important concepts which are commonplace nowadays. So in the same way that other technologies have incorporated this concept, why not photonics? And this is what actually we want to do. And it's very, um, why? Why do we need that? Because we have so many emerging applications which need photonics that if we care about just designing specific circuits for, for each application, then unless these applications are really, really, really massive, we will not have enough market. And there are a wide range of applications that can require flexibility as provided by this, by this concept. And I've just listed some in the telecommunications area. Some of them are very popular, like switching, okay? Some are less more new, uh, in quantum information, in sensing, in neurophotonics. Okay, these are examples, recent examples of circuits which could benefit from a generic uh, uh, approach and not a specific uh, uh, circuit uh, paradigm. So it's a very hot and timely top uh, topic, so we see a lot of very high impact publications being reported during the last couple of years. And what we aim here is of course, we aim to, to, to do this in photonics, hoping that we can benefit from the same uh, advantages that for example FPGAs has brought to, to electronics. 
And if we can do that, for example, we would be able to insert all these chips in the base stations in, in the fiber wireless uh, environment as, as we see, as we see here. Now, just to give you a short, I'm going to pass a, a very short video of the concept. Hopefully, this will work. Okay. This is the, this is the description of, of the processor and the four modes of operation. Okay. Well, this is the idea. You have some interface with the outside world and you should be able to, to do different kinds of operation. The first one is the electrical, electrical. You have your own electrical signal, input signal from the antenna. You want to process it and then you down convert and re-radiate it, for example. But then you have the other, uh, for example, electrical optical, you want to generate a signal, a high quality radio frequency broadband signal, and then you want to deliver it to an optical fiber link, okay? So that's another mode of operation. Or you, you might be uh, receiving some signal from an optical fiber link from um, whatever and you want to uh, just uh, detect it and and process it there and finish it or finally just you want to to receive your optical signal from somewhere do an, an inline processing and then deliver it to the next link okay so that's the the whole idea behind um, this concept so we need some kind of core uh, that in principle, let's see if we finish the video. Okay. Right. So the idea is that we need something in the middle which should be always the same thing and that we could program it. And the idea that we came across is to use a waveguide mesh. Some kind of uniform and regular waveguide structure that we can activate like a switch and uh, allows us to establish different paths depending on the application that we want to enable. Like, for example, okay, different paths, different functionalities. And basically, what we came uh, across is this concept of weak guide meshes, where here what we have is like a lattice. This is like solid state physics. We have like crystal lattice. Okay, and here, we have a cell that replicates. This is like, for example, an hexagonal cell that is replicated or a triangular or a square one. And you see here the, 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 the sides of, this, of each cell are composed of two waveguides which are coupled in the, in the middle part by a, what we call a tunable basic unit. And this tunable basic unit is just a max sender, uh, a balanced max sender interferometer. And this is like a tunable coupler. You have three dB coupler at the, at, the, at the input, at the output, and then you have some tuning devices in the middle. Depending on the phase shift that we, we impress here, we can independently switch uh, or select the, 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 the power splitting ratio and also the phase. So by acting over these phase shifters, okay, we can either uh, have a crossbar switch like here, or our intermediate coupler. This allows us to do a lot of things because it allows us to establish different paths here, which could be a switch or even a broadcast, okay? And with different phases. And this is the part of the device we have been uh, working on, fabricating like a very small proof of concept waveguide mesh here. This is the and the circuit, which is already have a, a, a zoom view of, of, the, of the hexagonal waveguides here. And the PCB is here and the wiring, of course, you can see. And of course, we have been able to validate that with, uh, it's just always the same hardware. And we change the programming, the phase uh, signals, the uh, electric signals that go into the phase shifters. And we have been able to uh, demonstrate more than 30 different uh, functionalities all in the same uh, uh, in the same chip um, this is one example 
uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, setup, you can see how we select part of the of the of the mesh. Some of these couplers are uh, operated as uh, as a crossbar switch, and other ones, like the ones in green, they are operated in a, in as a, as a um, variable coupler. And we, we can select, we can use some, another, we can leave others without being used. And this is a very simple example of a two lattice filter, a transversal filter. We can do more things, we can do rings, we can do delay lines here, for example, depending on the path that you activate, you have this delay or a different delay, etc. We can enable rings, uh, uh, couple cavity circuits, etc. Okay. Um, almost to finish. Let me see if I can put some video. The idea is that at the end of the day, when we assemble the electro-optic systems, we will all and the detectors, we will be able to implement different configurations. Okay, I'm going to switch it on again. I'm going to try to let me go back. Oh, this is one. This is the one. This shows you how to enable different structures, okay? This is a very simple max sender interferometer. This is a, a, a ring cavity, a simple ring cavity, okay? The other ones are not used here. If you want to increase the perimeter, the perimeter of, of the ring, the only thing you have to do is to enable different, uh, enable different uh, longer path. Even you can go into the outside perimeter, for example, and you can do more complicated things. This is a very simple structure because it only has six cells. But if you're able to to build a, a, a little bit more complex configurations with with uh, 20 or 25 cells, then the variety of, of structures that you can implement are very big. Okay, so let me try to conclude that. Um, I just mentioned some of these, uh, okay. Right, the idea would be then to enable different paths depending on the functionality that you want to implement. Yes, this is a, 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 a lattice filter, sorry, a, a crow filter. And this is like a, a, a pulse shaping fi a spectral filter followed by a dispersion compensator. Okay. Moreover, you can also enable a parallel uh, input, uh, multiple input, multiple output configuration. This is a very simple structure of a three, uh, a three by three Fourier transformer, but it can be extended to more, of course, and you can do different other uh, configurations. Okay, so this is a topic under study, and it also opens the possibility to do this parallel processing. Okay, so I'm finishing now. Um, hope to have been able to introduce you to the topic and also to convince you that we need some integration and of course, the aspect paradigm the, uh, using application specific is an option, but we we think we believe that if we want, if we want to uh, benefit from economies of scale and provide functionality, which is a very important and flexibility uh, uh, characteristics to our systems, then we should try to go to the other different uh, paradigm, which is doing something like FPGA in, in electronics, like flexible, reconfigurable, multifunctional circuit. And just a very example of a, a very simple cell uh, um, structure already provides you a lot of functionalities. In fact, the, the circuit that we de designed is able to perform over 100 functionalities, but we didn't have enough current sources to operate the, the chip. So, of course, there's more work to be done. Uh, losses are an important issue, so one of the, of, of, of the alternatives is to go to another platform which allows for lower losses like silicon nitride and I, this is a very preliminary 
uh, design of silicon nitride, which was carried for under this scheme uh, for fabrication under the BLC and CNM uh, uh, info, uh, sorry silicon nitride uh, fabrication platform. I can show you uh, the chip as it was uh, delivered uh, initially, and now it is already wired and it is ready for characterization. So you can see the hexagonal cells here as well. Okay, very easily here. Yeah. You can see the, the hexagons are here. So, uh, just I'm going to conclude uh, my talk and have some institutions to give uh, to thank and also draw your attention to this new cost network of excellence that is going to, to uh, address uh, specifically the, the issue of integrated microwave photonics. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jose, for your talk. So now there's a little bit of time for questions. Very clear. We work together, Jose. I don't want to make questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I understand that. I understand that the essential brick in the optical is the, the wake-eye mesh, like mm -hmm. what the transistor in terms of electronics. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, what, is your, what do you think about the, what is the lay of Moore in the photonics? What, what could be the scalability in the future? What is the rate of the scalability? I don't know. <laughs> That's a big, a good question. I could, uh, if I knew, I would formulate a law. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to say because this is, we are now in, a, it's probably like in electronics in the 70s or we're starting to, to have small and medium scale circuits. So who knows because uh, there are many trade-offs to, to take into account because uh, um, if you reduce the size of your, for example, say I want to have smaller cells okay because i i want to have uh, i want to use uh, be, be able to 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 fabricate more cells in in a given area then this is a, this is very important you have less losses but at the same time you have other constraints okay you have to operate your your uh, couplers your variable couplers and what i have shown you is some designs that work by heating okay so if your cells are smaller, then your heaters are closer. So they start to interact, thermally interact one, uh, one, uh, one heater with the other. And then probably you will have to, to resort, as Pascual, I think, said yesterday, to uh, other kinds of tuning uh, mechanisms like piezo or MEMS or whatever, which are not, they don't interact in, in that way. So there are a lot of things. I, I, I cannot give you a quest, uh, an answer. The other thing is that if you make your cells smaller, then your spectral periods grow. So if you want to do some kind, or you have in mind some kind of application where you don't want to have very big sp uh, spectral periods, like probably is RF, phot RF photonics would be one of these. Not terriers, for instance, but RF photonics, yes, because you need some gig gig gigahertz or whatever then your, 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 uh, if, if you make your cells smaller, then you have to go through more number of cells because you have to cross more sites. And then because you have losses, then you have, more, uh, you have some limitations. So it's not an easy question to, to, uh, to, to answer. Uh, but most certainly you would need some kind of guided way solution. About the uh, possibility of uh, reprogramming the device, yeah. is it not supposed to do this uh, really fast? In this case, no, because you're using thermal, thermal effects. Uh, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, because uh, it seems a computer that yeah. I can give a program and uh, let's do the uh, operation one after the other. Yeah. 
You can do that, but the other thing is uh, it depends also on the, on the, on the application. Sometimes we, we tend to think that we need a very fast reprogram, re, uh, program, uh, program, uh, programmability speed, tuning speed. And sometimes this is not the case because sometimes you don't need to process bit by bit or a piece, a very small piece of information. We don't need to go to such a small scale of time to change the system. Many applications don't require that because if you want to receive some given channel and you want to stay some time, uh, then it's, you don't need a tuning speeds of nanoseconds, for example. It depends on the, on the application. So, uh, or for example, you, if you are in, in, uh, using that like a, in a surveillance system, like a radar or whatever, you don't, you don't want to be able to tune at nanosecond speed. You don't need that. But of course, there's always this um, concern about the tuning speed. But if you want faster mechanisms, you can use faster mechanisms because you can always change, for example, the refractive index by carrier extraction, for example, which is faster. But it has not yet been developed for this mesh example, for example, for instance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So next speaker is uh, Robinson Crusoe from uh, University Carlos III Madrid and his talk uh, is on uh, millimeter wave applications of